Welcome back again this week to our subject on soteriology. This is class number eight, and uh, the last time we were together, we discussed uh, the subjects as dealing with, uh, we, we combined uh, the subject of uh, a little bit of, a little bit more of justification and righteousness, and, uh, and then we explained adoption. So we, by dealing with adoption, we brought in some more of the thoughts of regeneration to give you more of a foundation uh, to refresh you and we brought some stuff in there about justification to bring refreshing and then we brought some things in there about righteousness the things that we have from God and the benefits that we have uh, today we're going to move into another portion after talking about adoption we're going to move into another portion called sanctification now sanctification is something that everyone teaches and and this is a part of it, no matter where you're at or which camp you're in, we all believe that the uh, justification, the sanctification, the uh, perseverance, and the uh, glorification, they all stay in the same line, the same balance. Uh, I want to look at justification, and I want to look at them at all three viewpoints. There's three schools of thoughts that goes with sanctification, three. Number of, the first school of thought is, the initial act at regeneration. So when you hear the word regeneration, you understand that's when you got born again. So the first part about sanctification will be the initial act at regeneration. The second part will be uh, the process during your Christian walk after regeneration. And then the third part will be a complete and final work of sanctification and that is when we are glorified, uh, brought into the presence of God. Our bodies are changed. Uh, we're made whole. We're made complete. Uh, so there's nothing else to perfect. There's nothing else to uh, be separated from. And so in doing this, we want to understand. Some people believe that there was a total sanctification during the time of regeneration. There isn't a second phase of sanctification to where it's a process that you walk it out. They believe everything that you need, the complete wholeness was done at regeneration at the new birth. That doesn't always line up with what's going on because we are continually dealing with things in our life that we are being separated from. So I'm going to come from it from the three most common, and even most evangelical scholars will present this, is the initial sanctification at the time of regeneration or being born again. It's also a process. It's how we walk life out and a complete and final work where everything else is established and done. So let's get into the first part. It's an, at the initial act of regeneration. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'm going to start reading at verse 9. We're going to look in the scriptures here, verse 9 on chapter 6. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? The unrighteous. If you're unrighteous, you're, you're unregenerate, you're... Uh, you're, you haven't been regenerated. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, uh, adulterers, adulterers, nor uh, infeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covens, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extorters shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now we're going to revisit this when we get into the perseverance of the saints, okay? And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So people that were this way, people that partook in this, it says right here that at, gen at regeneration when all of these people, the fornicators, the adulterers, the abusers, 
uh, and everything that's there, during the time of regeneration, it says some of you, it says, and such were some of you, or the ones that he read, he said, what I just mentioned, some of you were part of that number. You were fornicators, you were idolaters, and you were adulterers, and uh, you were abusers of themselves with mankind. You were this. Then he says, and such of you, su and such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. So what he's saying is, by the Spirit of God, we got born again by the Spirit of God. It's The Spirit is the one that goes back to that internal call. Unless the Spirit draw us, we can't get there. So regardless of what we came out of, a lot of people had never heard of the Lord Jesus Christ until they were older in years. And that right moment at that right time when the right gospel message went out, the right inward call was there. They went through faith and repentance. They went through regeneration. And all of a sudden, during that time where they went through that regeneration, all of these things that we just mentioned, thieves, covetousness, drunkards, revilers, uh, extortioners, all, everyone that was involved in that, now by the work of the Spirit and the work of regeneration, something took place called sanctification. We began to be set apart now into a new life. See, there ought to be something to change in our life. If someone says, I've been regenerated, I've been born again, but there's no change in their life, then we have to look at it and say, did they really have an experience with God? There's so many people that say things just because they want to say things, and nothing really happened in their life. Just because somebody comes to the altar after hearing the gospel call, and uh, they come to the altar, and they pray a prayer after us, if they, really, if they really were not in it on the inside, they just did it to uh, make someone happy, or let's take this for an example. Let's say a young boy wants to uh, date a girl, and she's very dedicated into her Christian walk, but yet he still lives after the flesh and after the world, and she told him, I am not going to date anybody that's not a born-again believer. So he says, ha-ha, I'm going to fix this thing, and then I'll go to church with her, and when they give that gospel call, I'll go up there, and I'll, I'll pray that prayer and shake the preacher's hand, whatever i got to do, and, and then I'll tell her that I got born again, and I'll be able to start dating her. Just because he prayed that prayer and he did that, that didn't separate him f from anything. If his heart wasn't regenerated, he is still everything that he came out of. Well, he didn't come out of any of it. Let me rephrase that. He's still dead. He's still in his sin. He's still in his sick sorrows. And so there ought to be a change. I believe when someone gets born again, the first step of sanctification comes at that time. There ought to be a change in their life. That's what happens. The process, it's a process. It deals with our walk. It deals with our walk. And so we have to understand that our walk with God, there's going to be a difference. People are going to see, what happened to you? Where did, where did you come from? What, what went on uh, with, with your life? So at, born, at the born again experience, you came out of this and you were sanctified and set apart. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 22 and 23. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain from all appearance of evil. First Thessalonians, chapter, uh, that would be chapter 5, verse 22. First Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. 23, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who shall also do it. Now, even though we're called, faithful is he that called us, and he will also do it. He will also perform it. But the Bible said that the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray that your whole spirit, soul, and body be, be preserved blameless. 
So during this time of being regenerated, sanctification came into being. A simple word of sanctification is just being right and doing right. I want to look at something because some people say, how can you tell the difference between sanctification and justification if justification is a legal standing? And how can you tell the difference? In the book, in Grudem's book, A Systematic Theology, and on page 747, at the top of the page, he also deals with the three stages of sanctification, but he puts two columns. Number one, he has, he has justification and he has sanctification. Justification, sanctification, here in his book. Under justification, he has legal standing. Under sanctification, he has internal condition. Under justification, once for all time. Continually, under sanctification, continuous through life. You are justified once for all time, but under sanctification, it's continuous throughout life. Under justification, entirely God's work. Under sanctification, we cooperate. See, sanctification, you play a role in this. Justification, it wasn't you. It was all the work of God. The legal standing, you didn't have anything to do with that. Internal condition. Perfect in this life, not perfect in this life. The same in all Christians, greater in some than in others. So, when you're looking at justification, justification deals with legal standing once for all time. It's entirely God's work, perfect in this life. You can't improve on justification. This, it's the same in all Christians. You didn't get a different justification than I got. You didn't get a different, uh, you, a, a different righteousness than I have. But on sanctification, internal condition, what's on the inside, Continuous throughout life. You've got to walk this thing out throughout life. we got to cooperate with this. Not perfect in this life. We're not going to be perfect. we just got to continue to, to press in and keep walking in the goodness of God. Greater in some than others. What does that mean? That means some people will live this life and they will do it better. They will keep a better control. They'll keep a better grip on themselves than others. So when you look at the Two things, justification, regeneration. Thank God it was there. All we did was answer the gospel call and allowed the Lord to do a work inside of us. And it was it. We can't approve on justification. We can't approve on, on, uh, on righteousness. We cannot approve on adoption. We can't approve on that. What we approve, what we can approve on is how we live this life in sanctification. You know, when I was a young guy, I used to be in churches. I came out of a spirit-filled Pentecostal mainline setting as a kid. And uh, I heard people testify all the time. There wasn't a lot of teaching taking place in the church I was in as a kid. But our people say, thank God I'm saved, which we would call regenerate, re regenerated. I don't know if they would have got that term. Thank God I'm saved, sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit. So when you're saved, they understood there was a sanctification, there was a separation that took place during salvation, during regeneration, during the born-again experience, and they knew they were filled with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit came and dwelled within them. So this concept I was used to from a kid. I'm saved or I'm regenerated, I'm born again. I'm sanctified. I'm, I'm set apart now. The things that I once were involved in, I'm no longer going to be involved in. And I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, or some would say the Holy Ghost. I'm filled with Him, not it. It's a Him. It's Him. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's, uh, you didn't get an it, you got Him on the inside of you. And this sanctifying power separated me from this. Desires begin to change. Want to's begin to change. Our cravings begin to change. And as long as we 
continue to renew our mind, as long as we continue to control our flesh, this sanctification works in our life. Because it all came through Jesus Christ. It all came through Jesus Christ. Go with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. One of my favorite verses. Let me, uh, let me just read verse 29. I like it. That no flesh shall glory in his presence. Flesh can't glory in the presence of God. It can't. 30. But of him are you in Christ Jesus. Now of all the things we talked about, you ought to be convinced of your positional truth. If you're not, you need to take this class again. If you have been listening, you ought to be convinced that you are not just some poor, meagerly getting by individual, but you have the ability to approach God with boldness, to stand in His presence. You're not like Adam in sin who's hiding behind the rock. You are in Christ Jesus. Who of God is made unto us? Christ Jesus has been made unto us wisdom, righteousness, he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. His righteousness was bestowed upon us. And sanctification and redemption. That according as it is written, he, hath, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You can't glory in your flesh. You glory in the Lord. So Jesus Christ was made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification and redemption. If somebody says, what did Jesus bring to you besides being the substitute sacrifice and dying that death to be born again? Number one, he's been made for us, for wisdom, for righteousness, for sanctification and redemption. These are things that he's been made unto. And we don't glory in the flesh. We glory in the Lord. He is my wisdom. He is my sanctification. He is the one that I hold to. I didn't have it in my notes, but another verse comes to me uh, in the book of John. You remember John chapter 17 where Jesus prayed the prayer and uh, he prayed the prayer that we may be one as him and his father was one. Let's look at something there. John chapter 17, during that prayer. As he prayed that prayer, uh, we'll get into this chapter probably in the uh, perseverance of this. When he prayed that prayer, uh, let's look at uh, verse 14 of chapter 17. I have given them thy word. This is written in red. Jesus is speaking. I have given them thy word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Now, these are my people. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. They lived in the world, but they were not of the world. What sanctification in the order of salvation? Being separated from this world. Being separated from this world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou should keep them from the evil. Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Now, what sanctifies us is the truth of God's word. If Without truth, we don't know where to go. We don't know how to live. We don't know uh, what our next move is. Number one, we are sanctified through his truth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about that. Sanctify them through thy truth. Your word is truth. Your word is truth. See, his word's not just fact. His word is truth. You're saying, oh, that doesn't make sense. I, I tell people, just because of me and my understanding, that the truth is far greater than a fact. Let me give you an example. Someone would say something like, uh, the doctors say there is no hope for this person, none. But if we believe in the atonement, if we believe 
that Jesus Christ died on the cross to redeem man, which was threefold, poverty, sickness, spiritual death, a second death, a death unto hell. If he redeemed us, if he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed, who placed our sins in his body upon the tree, that we be in debt unto sin may live unto righteousness, by his stripes we are healed. If his word is true, even though it's a fact by medical science, this man will die. There is no hope in medical science. That's a fact. But now there's something greater than fact. It's called truth. Who bore our sins in his body on the tree? That we being dead to sin may be alive or live unto righteousness. By whose stripes we are healed. Oh, that means just spiritual healing. No, that meant spiritual healing. That meant physical healing and all. Remember the leper came and said, If thou will, thou can make me clean. He said, It's my will. Be clean. So we look at these things and we understand it says here, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Verse 19, And for their sakes, and for their sakes, the ones he's talking about, I sanctified myself through thy truth. I sanctified myself through thy truth. Now, Jesus being the righteous, spotless Son of God, what do you mean I sanctified myself through thy truth? What he's saying is, I have lived this life. I came separated. I walked in this world. Remember, Jesus says that the enemy could find nothing in me. Glory to God. He tried to find things in me, but he couldn't find anything in me. Why? I kept things separated. The truth separates. If sanctification is a simple term, is if is, is sanctification is separation, let me give you not just in the theological terms of sanctification at the time of regeneration, but let's look at this. If truth is what sanctifies us and sets us apart, you can look at it as natural things. When you know the truth about certain things naturally, it sets you apart from being cheated naturally. If you understand the truth about money, if you, if you know that something cost $10 and you gave them a 20, you know you are to get 10 back, or something cost 15, you gave somebody a 20, and you know I'm to give five back, and all of a sudden they give you nothing back or give you one or two back, by understanding the truth of money, basic mathematics, you know that this is going to keep me free from being ripped off. So the truth is what makes sanctification work. Sanctify them through thy truth, for thy word is true. Separate them. Jesus said, I separated myself. I positioned myself. Remember, he said in Mark when the father brought, there was a man who brought his son to the disciples to have this demon cast out of him. The disciples tried, but they could not. Jesus came by and saw a multitude of people, crowd of people, talking with his men, and, and there was the man there with the son, and, and Jesus says, what's the conversation about with my men? The father of the son spoke up and said, I brought my son unto your disciples to have him cast out, but they could not do it. It didn't say they would not, it said they could not. So Jesus started talking to the father, you know, uh, how long has it, how long has this boy had this demon? And, and they were all there. But he made another interesting statement. He said, uh, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. Bring him un unto me. And so when Jesus said, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? bring him unto me, what he is saying is, uh, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to bring understanding, uh, or I'm going to keep uh, presenting this to you so you'll get it. How long am I going to keep doing this, and, and uh, how long am I going to keep showing you what needs to be done before you get it yourself? 
how long am I going to continue to do this before you realize how to do it yourself? When he said that, apparently Jesus was telling them, telling them and showing them how things worked. So in essence, this is what he's saying. I sanctified myself for their sakes. Why? How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? We don't talk that way today. I don't get up my congregation and says, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Ah, people would laugh me out the door. Even though it's a King James Bible that I read I love most of the time. But no, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I continue to do what I'm doing before you get it and start doing what I'm doing and get the results that I'm doing? And Jesus said, for their sakes, those who are following me, those who are, are walking with me, for their sakes I do this through your truth and through your word. Jesus has been made unto us. He's been made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. He's been made, known, he's been made unto us. Colossians chapter 3. In the book of Colossians, the third chapter. All right. Colossians, the third chapter. Eight through twelve. But now you also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. We're talking sanctification. You put things away from you. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with your deeds. Here's what he's saying is when you put off the old man at regeneration, things change, my friend. He says when you did this, this filthy communication should fall away from you. And you have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created you. So we're talking about sanctification during the time of regeneration. Something happened. There needed to be a change. If we say we got regenerated, and yet we're still practicing anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications, we're lying to one another, where was there any sanctification during regeneration? See, I don't believe that we could just, just say, well, let's pray this. I believe we can. But that doesn't mean everybody gets it. Pray a mass prayer today and go out and say uh, 300 people got, got regenerated, born again. No, 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 no. Just because somebody repeated after you, there needs to be a change in here. Old things are passed away. All things become new. And part of that newness, in a part of that newness, together with that newness, is this sanctification that we have. All right? The sanctification that we have. Number two, it is a process. It deals with our walk and not just our talk. Note what they had personally, they must seek ex 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 experientially. There ought to be an experience. What we have personally, we must have it in our life. It must be active in what's going on. It is living a life in holiness without the traditional bondage that people talk about. See, people look at sanctification and holiness as bondage. It, doesn't have to, it has nothing to do with bondage. I realize people can preach anything. I know people's preaching you can live any way you want, and it doesn't matter how you live. As long as you repeat a prayer, you're all right. There's no scriptural basis that you can convince me on that that's, that's gospel. Well, if somebody showed me scriptures, if we had time, I could show you scriptures that we just read some while ago. Those who do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's simple. So, there needs to be a walk. You need to have evidence of this. Walking in the fear and favor of the Lord. Living in this realm of obedience. So, there was sanctification that came with regeneration, and then there's a sanctification that comes during our daily walk. We're completely separated. 
These are things. See, once you get born again, you can't cut everything off. Let's take for an example. Say you're, you're here and you're in this class. You came out of the drug scene. You were, you were on drugs. You were addicted to alcohol. You were addicted to porn. These are things you came out of. Now, I know some people say that when I got born again and regenerated, all of it was gone immediately. I know, I know people that has fought this and battled this. How do you help them, Pastor? How do you help people like that? Number one, you've got to feed them the truth. You've got to start getting their mind renewed. Their spirit got renewed. It got reborn. You've got to get their mind renewed. Sanctification starts coming in. We've got to start separating. You, 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 can't, you can't separate everything at once. You've got you to begin to get this thing and deal with this. If you say, okay, today this is off, this is off, that's off. The first time they fall, they're going to be under so much condemnation and bondage. They're not going to be able to live in this thing. This thing is a walk. It's a walk. It's conversion. Born again, you've got to get, conver you got to get converted. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Converted is not just an uh, just a instant process. It is, but it isn't. You're saying, but I, it has to be. It is, but it isn't. There's a time that now through the sanctification, through sanctification, yes, there's an element at conversion, an element at regeneration, but now there is a continual walk away from perversion. And this is what's not being taught a lot. People are getting born again and being left on their own and they're suffering. A born again man regenerated and not knowing how to start living a sanctified life. Jesus said, I live my life sanctified for their sakes so they could see how this is to follow. I, I brought some things here that I want to look at because when I deal with sanctification on a daily walk, I have a hard time separating it from living a life of holiness. God said, be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, holiness can be, you know, if some of you understand this, uh, the holiness doctrine, you can't cut your hair, you can't wear short sleeves. Uh, I don't wear long sleeves because it's a doctrinal thing. I wear it because I like these kind of shirts. It's a simple thing. Uh, but the truth is, People say, you know, women can't wear dresses, women can't wear pants, they got to wear skirts. Uh, it can't be this high, it can't be that low. It's just all kind of things. And that, well, that's what holiness was relegated down to. And they, they use scriptures like pursue peace with all men and holiness, for without which no man shall see the Lord. And without holiness, you're saying you can't go to heaven, and there's an aspect of, aspect of that is correct. But what it's saying is, on purpose, you pursue peace with all men and holiness of the heart. For if the heart's not right, no man shall see the Lord. Not just get to heaven, but you can't see God's way of doing things here. I don't want to just miss God in my everyday walk and say, hopefully one day I'll see him in heaven. I want to see God's hand. I want to see the direction God's going. I want to see the direction God's moving. I want to walk in this confidence and what brings me in this confidence is this element of sanctification. That's what brings me there. This true element of sanctification. So when I look at holiness, you're saying, what is holiness? Okay, let me look at, let, let me look at this holiness here a minute. Holiness is, you love what God loves. See, sanctification is we're going to be separated from the things that don't please God. When he said a while ago, you know, these things, wrath and malice and all of these other deals, these are things that don't please God. These are things that doesn't. The works of the flesh don't please God. We want to be sanctified. We're going to do this. I tell, I've told my congregation, when I first got born again, the rope that I was on, let's use this, was a lot longer. God knew that I was going to mess up, but the more I walked with God, the more He reeled me in. The things that I once desired, I no longer desire. Not because people beat me over the head and say, you're going to hell. No, I just don't desire that anymore. Why? His truth is separating me. His truth is bringing me to a place. 
I understand the first love of Jesus Christ. So holiness is not bondage. It's loving what God loves, despising what God despises. If one is going to walk in holiness, he's not going to do the things that is going to displease God. And so what I want, the word to sanctify me, separate me from things that don't please God. All right? Holiness is the... Or, or holiness, another way to describe holiness is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord and holiness could be synonymous. So, you know, the Bible says, you know, fear the Lord and hate evil. If, if holiness and the fear of the Lord is synonymous, then it says fear the Lord and hate evil. Well, what does it mean to hate evil? Well, then you have to understand what evil is. So now you've got to look up the word evil, and I looked up the simple definition in Vines, Dictionary, W.E. Vines Dictionary, the word evil. It is things that are bad, contemptible, wicked, harmful, and wrong, and worthless. Proverbs 8.13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. So according to uh, W.E. Vines, it gives me the def definition of evil. So when I decide that sanctification is not going to just be what happens at regeneration, but sanctification is going to be a process, even Mr. Grudem says, a continuous thing throughout your life. Since it's a process, I want to continue to work on things that separate me from this. I'm going to love God. I'm going to despise the things that He despises. I'm going to turn from evil, the fear of the Lord, the holiness of God, synonymous, which the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Evil is things that is contemptible against God and so forth and so on. So I want to be able to, to do this. I want to be able to approach God. Scriptures like Psalms 15, 1 and 2, Who shall abide in the tabernacle? Or who shall come to God's holy hill? Holy mount, those with clean hands and a pure heart. It says it again in the 24th chapter of, of the book of Psalms. The 24th chapter. Walking in the fear of God. Walking in righteousness, walking in holiness, allowing sanctification, it leads to life. It leads to life. And I want you to understand that if we do this, it will separate us from, th from all these things that try to bind us from living a life of freedom. So, yes, you were sanctified. If someone says, well, I was sanctified and I was born again, you can say that's exactly right according to the Scriptures in 1 Corinthians and 2 Thessalonians and Colossians. You are right. These, these were verses that verify I had sanctification taking place in my life at the time of regeneration. But don't stop there. Phase two is a walk. You walk this out. Totally separated. I'm going to continue to live a life of sanctification until this life is over. Until I either go by the grave or I am changed and transformed and glorified. Where Jesus said, those which are alive and remain shall be changed, shall be glorified in the twinkling of an eye. I will live, live a life of sanctification all the way to the end when it comes to this. Now, there will be, during that time, what we're going to call, in this realm of sanctification, complete and final sanctification. You have, you have the initial sanctification at regeneration. You have the process that you walk in that we even said Jesus talked about in John 17. You have this process of sanctification. And then you have the complete and final sanctification at the end. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. You're right. The last verse was in the book of Colossians, so you ought to be able to get right there pretty quick. Philippians chapter 3. Uh, let's go to verse 20. There's so many things to read in here, but let's just go to verse 20, verse 21. For our conversation, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus. Now, this conversation, I want you to look at a word lifestyle we have here. Who shall change our vile bodies that we may be fashioned like unto his glorious body 
according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Until this day happen that he changes us, which is total complete sanctification. No more sorrow, no more temptation, no more flesh, no more defeats in life, total sanctification. Until that time, we have to continue to walk this out on a daily basis, on a daily basis. Now, Romans chapter 6 will give us some information here. We've read this, referred to it a couple times. Romans chapter 6 gives us some of this, and we'll talk about this also uh, under the perseverance of the saints, or another word we'll use when we get into that, talking about assurance. Where he says here, what shall we say to these things? Shall we continue sin that grace may abound? When we talked about grace during the call, we said that was God's grace that he, that he gave us. So we understand that there's things that we can do. We have a decision. We, we can do things because, because it's, it's at our will, at our disposal. Let's go, let's go to verse 11. Likewise reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto God. Neither yield your members. Don't allow yourself to get involved in that. How do you keep from yielding your members as instruments of unrighteousness? You've got to take the word. You've got to be a disciple. The Bible says in John chapter 8, it says uh, where it talks about who the Son sets free is free indeed. Before that, he says, to those, he says, he just spoke to those Jews that just believe. If you continue in my word, if you continue in my truth, if you continue, if you continue, then you shall be my disciple indeed. He didn't even call them a disciple until they continued in the truth. Then you shall be my disciple indeed. Then you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. What does that mean, the truth shall make you free? The truth shall separate you from all of these things. The only thing I know that separates will be the truth of God's Word. Nothing else matters except for the truth of God's Word. You shall know the truth, and truth shall set you free. Likewise reckon you yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto righteousness. All right? Let not sin reign in your mortal bodies, that you should obey it in lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God. Yield. What does yield mean? In the United States of America and around the world, I have literally traveled around the world. I've not preached in every country around the world, but I have been around the world preaching the gospel. Now, in America, we have a traffic sign called a yield sign. Other countries have the same kind of setup, but the sign is shaped different and looks different than our sign. When you see that triangle lined in red, that yield sign, you understand that you must yield to the person who has the right of way. When you, when you merge off of a highway and somebody else is merging on, two people are merging on the same, merging on the highway in the same direction, there is one of them will have a yield sign. If there's not a total stop sign, one will have a yield sign. And what that yield sign is, that uh, you don't have to just stop, but you have to be cautious of what's happening around you. So if there's someone coming, that person coming this direction has the right of way. So to yield, see, in walking in sanctification, you deal with yielding your life. You deal with holiness. You deal with separation. So when I'm walking this walk out of sanctification, I have to understand, yield yourself as member, yield your members as instruments of righteousness. So to yield myself, in essence, like I like to say, I yield my right away to God's right way. I have a right. Yeah, the Bible says there's a way that seemeth right in the man, but the end thereof is death and destruction. So I don't want to just do what's right in my own eyes. I don't want to just get upset just because something aggravates me in the flesh. I want to yield myself to God. I want to separate. You know what I want? Clean hands. And I want a pure heart. 
I want to be able to draw nigh to God without any sense of guilt, condemnation, or shame. You're saying, well, according to what you taught, teacher, you could do that because your justification, your righteousness, and your adoption. You're exactly right. You've listened well. But the truth is, if I walk in the flesh and I don't allow sanctification in my life, it will condemn me. The Bible says if your heart condemns you not, you have confidence with God, and whatever you ask the Father, He'll do it for you. That's in 1 John. 1 John, if your heart condemns you not, you have confidence with God. See, people that just take the sanctification, the initial sanctification, or just wait for the final glorification type of sanctification, and they don't walk this out, this process, where it becomes an experience, becomes an experience in life and not just a positional thing at regeneration. If people don't walk this out, you will become condemned. It's not God's will, but if your heart condemns you not, you have confidence. If your heart condemns you, you don't have confidence. If you don't have confidence, how do you come boldly? And how do you stay away from things? So yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. All right? Yield yourself... It says here, but yield yourselves unto God as instruments. Y yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but now you're under grace. Sin no longer has dominion over us. And so therefore I have the power and I have the ability to walk this sanctified life. All right? Remember, justification. We had nothing. We, 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 we didn't play a role in that. Sanctification, outside of the initial act of regeneration, we play a role in what we do. And I believe in God that with what took place in the initial setup and what takes place during my continual walk, if I cooperate with this, even though I've not been perfect, but God's going to continue to help me, He's going to continue to lead me and continue to guide me, then... I will position myself for the ultimate day where I'll be able to spend eternity with God. And uh, it's going to be a glorious time. So if you look at this, sanctification is part of salvation. It's part of the order of God. So you live a sanctified life. Don't let it be just another religious term. I'm sanctified. I was sitting with... with uh, my staff, my administrator, who grew up in the Nazarene church, his father is still a senior pastor of the Nazarene church, one of the key doctrines of the Nazarene, the, a great long-standing evangelical church, the Nazarene, one of their key doctrines is sanctification, separation from this world, living right with God. One of the key doctrines, I watch, I sat with his father and listened to him tell me that that which was once a key doctrine in their church, even though they believed there was an element of, at regeneration, even though they know that one day we're going to be eternally sanctified through the glorification of our bodies, they stood firm. Wesley stood firm. If you look at the Wesleyan church, John Wesley believed it was the sanctified life, your everyday life, that brought you the confidence and the faith and the victory to continue to see it through. And now to see these prominent evangelical denominations that are turning from that, they're losing, there's a term that says they're losing their north. That means they're losing, losing their direction. But we have to make sure we stay firm in this and live this life of live this life of victory. I encourage you to go back to your books. I just gave you a highlight. I just gave you the points. Uh, there are several pages, several pages. I, I don't remember in this book by Guy P. Duffield. There are several pages of sanctification in lectures and systematic theology. I still refer to these. I've had this book, this one book, for over 30 years. I still refer to them. You have also you have also the uh, Grudem's book. You have the dictionary of theological terms that you can look at, and, that, and that'll help you. Uh, so as we grow together, I want you to know God's doing something big in you.
and let God continue to do it. Blessings.